as as uh, as as Delisha said, I am a corrections unit supervisor in Minneapolis. I supervise uh, a team of probation officers who supervise domestic violence cases post disposition in the community. But we've done a ton of work, much much of it with the help actually of Connie Sponsla from BWJP, who you've already heard from, um, on our um, on our evidence-based practice and our response to domestic violence. So I don't know, I'm not exactly timed on my on my talk here. I'm just gonna kind of work my way through a couple of concepts and then the through the, the two tools, and I can certainly hang around for questions if that works and you need me to do it. So now I'm going to um, go ahead and start, and if I keep swinging my head around, I apologize if that's distracting. I've got to move these slides from my from my other side here. So when we talk about um, risk assessment in a in a correctional setting, we're really talking about whether or not um, uh, we want to determine if somebody's likely to reoffend or repeat those behaviors. And I think that's the most common use. In, in a correction setting. Uh, another um, purpose, of course, would be the risk of lethality, and more and more that's crept into our own decision making in corrections. Um, I know it's been sort of the, the hallmark of the, of the advocates um, to focus on that, but it's, it's also some of those concepts have become important for us as well. Um, and here's the advocacy piece of uh, using risk assessment to enhance strategic construction of safety planning. But mainly, as I said, with corrections, we're looking to use risk assessment to figure out an appropriate intervention, make appropriate recommendations to the court and to our batter intervention providers. Um, and, and honestly, the sad part about this is that we're using it also for allocation of resources and who gets our attention. We can't, in departments of corrections, we always struggle with who we're going to supervise and for how long. and whether or not um, it, it's necessary um, and important that this particular offender gets resources over another. So that becomes a big piece of this. In departments of corrections, evidence-based practice is, is like the biggest buzzword. If, if, if it's not EBP focused, um, it's, it's uh, thrown out the, the window many times. So EBP, as you know, comes from research, and in our case, it's research that has been determined um, to figure out what reduces recidivism. There are eight, if you go online, there are eight principles uh, for effective intervention. You can just Google um, evidence-based practice, eight principles, and you'll come up with a, a group of things. Um, but the two I want to talk about today with, with the our focus on these two risk tools are the need to assess actuarial risk and needs and then to target the interventions or case plans to those risk and needs. The other piece I really want you to focus on and, 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 and I'm always um, ringing that bell with my department is that there is a real tendency among evidence-based practitioners around the country, especially in departments of corrections, to focus on criminogenic risk. And criminogenic risk, these are things like the uh, LSCMI, which is the level of service case management uh, system, which is one of the tools that's used all over the country. They tend to focus on what we think of as uh, the kind of criminal risk that we are so used to dealing with in departments of corrections. And it has to do with things like um, employment, criminal, associates, criminal associates chemical, mental health, gangs, those kinds of things. Um, but when we look at domestic violence risk, and this is always a challenge for, for, for departments of corrections, many of the DV offenders we see don't score high on those criminogenic risk tools. They look like low risk offenders, but they're not, and, and we've certainly seen it through our fatality review and other situations, um, that, that DV risk looks different many times than typical criminogenic risk and getting people to focus and expand on criminogenic risk with DV risk markers is, is huge and it's been kind of a, an uphill battle. So just as a point of reference, I would add that um, the American Probation and Parole Association came out with a manual in 2009 and I think somewhere in here, next slide or two, I've got a link to it. But one of the 41 guidelines of practice that they espouse is that if you're going to use those generic criminogenic risk tools, you've got to supplement with DV-specific 
risk assessment um, in order to, to be able to make sure you actually capture the, the people who are high risk uh, for DV. So a couple of the concerns about instruments, and maybe Connie went through some of this with you, but the reality is it's, there aren't a lot of validated instruments, still fairly a young science, little, a, only a little independent validation. Um, the other concern with that is that we take a score from one of these instruments and limit our whole system response to what is very complex behavior. So that's, that's concerning and, and is always one of the things we have to keep focused on. There's a dispute about whether um, the actuarial method is as effective as the clinical. And so we may say to ourselves, well, I'm a good clinician. I'm a, I'm a, a, a psychologist. I ought to be able to diagnose um, what's going on with this person. Um, as opposed to an actuarial method which really looks at, has, is devised to take a couple of the common factors from people who have proven to be high risk and, and apply those to others to determine how risky they are. And then you also have to focus on what kind of prediction you need. Um, if you're looking to predict lethality, you're going to use uh, one kind of instrument, whereas if you're looking to predict recidivism, um, it's important to use another. From my perspective, I think as a practitioner for a long time in this area, I think we have to do both. I think we, we do the recidivism pre predictors, but then we layer on what are some of the lethality factors that we're seeing so that we make sure we case plan to, to address those. But knowing what it is you're predicting is important because it'll, it really informs your choice of an instrument. Another piece here is the difference between the sources of information and the intended beneficiary and purpose. So, for example, if I'm if I'm sitting in the jail on the night shift and I'm doing a uh, a bail evaluation, I I need to know who what I'm gonna what I'm gonna have as a source of information. Am I going to be able to talk to the arrestee or the perpetrator? Am I going to be able to talk to the victim? Maybe not. Maybe I'm going to be doing this entirely on criminal justice records that are available to me. And if I pick an instrument that's got to have that specific input from a, a perpetrator and a victim, then my, my scoring isn't going to be accurate. So knowing what it is you're going to need and if it's going to be available to you in that se uh, setting. Um, and then lastly, for I think all of us, um, it's really a unique situation um, because we know the victim and it, may, it presents an ethical issue for us. So for example, if I supervise a carjacker and he's, he's an opportunist, he's got, he's got all kinds of risk um, on that criminogenic risk scale that I mentioned earlier, I won't necessarily know who his next victim is, but if I supervise a domestic violence offender, a high risk domestic violence offender, I can pretty much have an idea. It's either going to be the exist, his current victim or a new victim that he is, becomes involved with. So I think that, that makes us have to have a, a, a real ethical um, view of what we're doing. So again, American Probation and Parole Association guidelines, as I said, um, number five is that a thorough, consistent, pre-release, pre-sentence, or intake investigation is conducted in all cases of intimate partner violence one of the guidelines I want to reference here and one of the reasons for, for corrections folks to do a risk assessment. Um, and number nine is one that I already talked to you about, which is that if a standard risk assessment is used, you've got you've to gotta have protocols in place to override scores if, if DV factors are, are present. Um, I also should say when we look at number five above there, it says all cases of intimate partner domestic violence. It doesn't say just the felonies. It doesn't say um, just the gross misdemeanors and felonies. It really says all, and I think that's um, is been a tough one for corrections departments who are used to not doing much with misdemeanors at all. Um, and so here is the link for the APPA manual. If you, I don't know if there are corrections folks in the room. Honestly, I just raced back to my computer from a couple of meetings, department meetings, and. I meant to ask who was going to be in the audience, but if you uh, want to look at a 200-page corrections uh, manual about um, su the supervision of the assessment and supervision of DV offenders, there's your link. Okay, so we're going to talk briefly about the DVSI. Now, the DVSI is is uh, been around for a while. Um, it was developed by the the DV uh, Risk Reduction Project in Colorado. Um, 
State Courts Administrator's Office, and it was funded by VAWA, so it is in the public domain, and, and we've used it for free all these years. It was developed in 2000, and they intended to use it as a pretrial screener and, and a pre-screener for a more intense risk tool such as the SARA. We've used it kind of as a, we've used used it in a couple, couple different places, but right now it's a part of our pre-sentence investigation on all um, domestic cases. We normed it initially in 2000 against uh, about, about, uh, 2000, um, about 2,000 offenders. We had, and this was the misdemeanor um, referral population, I think there were about 1,600 uh, people who had the DVSI, and some of them were re repeated during that year, so we had two DVSIs with them. And then we did follow-up research in 2010, which I'll talk about a little more uh, in a bit. So we're going to, I've been told, I cut out a lot of the fluff just to give you guys the, the hard basics here. So we're just going to go through the DVSI. Um, there are 12 items, and um, I'm just going to basically talk through them, and then we'll talk a bit about the scoring. So the first item on the DVSI is prior convictions which are not domestic violence related and these can be criminal traffic. In our jurisdiction we have, we get cases that either have a stay of imposition, that means like um, the court has stayed sentencing uh, and, and agrees to dismiss after a period of time, we call it Minnesota Statute 609135, but the court Im accepts the guilty plea, um, stays in position, gives the person a probationary period to, to do the, to do some things and see how they do. A stay of execution is uh, where the court imposes a sentence and it might be 365 days in jail, uh, stay 355 days which means um, they will serve 10 days and then the execution of the rest of it is stayed while they're on probation. And we have this other weird third thing in Minnesota called stay of adjudication. And that's where the prosecutor accepts a guilty plea in writing, but it's not entered into the court record. But these are all forms where there has been some guilty So the, the operative word here, the important word, is prior convictions, except domestic violence. The second one is interesting because it doesn't, you'll notice the operative word is arrest. So this is prior arrests for assault, harassment, and menacing. Now this is the language that um, we got from the state of Colorado when they developed it. We've expanded it a bit to include cases charged by summons and cases in which uh, the suspect was gone on arrival. In our jurisdiction, we pay very close attention to suspect, we call them GOA cases, because we know the, the police would have, they would have been apprehended had they not taken off. So we're counting it as a as a police contact and that's because there are studies that show, I think San Diego had a study where they reviewed domestic homicides and determined that on average there were five police contacts on the domestic homicide cases they reviewed. Absolutely no correlation to conviction because as we know or if there are prosecutors in the room you know these sometimes can be tough cases to prosecute and they can fall apart pretty quickly. So that's the, the second piece. Um, I don't know if you guys have a score sheet and you're following along, but I should say that most of these items are, have a couple of different scoring options. It'd be zero for not, not, nothing apparent, um, one, two, or in some cases three points based on uh, the correlation to, to um, risk. So um, I haven't got the scoring sheet in front of me, so I'm hoping you do, but at any rate, those are the first two items of the 12. So moving along, whoops, I gotta go back. Moving along, um, we're gonna be asking or trying to determine if there's been a prior domestic violence intervention or referral. This could be therapy, education, or counseling. And if there are probation officers in the room, this is where you'd be looking for your through your um, your probation um, history to determine it. Maybe it's a situation where a victim says yes, he went to counseling, or yes, I, he was. Um, uh, we tried marriage counseling, they referred him for um, counseling, whatever. If there's been a prior referral for some kind of intervention based on the, the violence behavior, um, there are some points that accrue here. Number four is prior drug and alcohol treatment um, referrals. And this is, this is a, of course, a, a big deal in corrections, and we've been doing this forever. We've long recognized the correlation between 
um, drug or alcohol use and um, uh, and uh, just being on probation, period. You'll notice it doesn't say that I didn't use the word causal because we don't think about drug or alcohol use as being causal with domestic violence, but, but rather more of a correlation. So this would include, um, as I said, any substance abuse, education, and counseling. Um, and when I train on this with, with probation officers, we also focus on history that includes things like DWIs, where there has been a um, where there has been substance abuse education and counseling as a matter of course pretty standard in most uh, probation cases involving some of those things and so in many cases we can actually infer that there's been um, a treatment referral or education around chemical health because of, of certain kinds of things in the criminal history. The fifth item uh, is a history of domestic violence re related restraining orders. Now, I know there's a bunch of acronyms up there, so I'm going to just talk briefly about what they are. Criminal no contact order is something that we utilize in, in Minnesota, which allows a judge as part of a criminal case to, to issue no contact orders. And in our system, we have something called the DANCO, the Domestic Abuse No Contact Order, which actually is a separate order in criminal cases requiring that the person stay away and it gets entered into the NCIC, the, the, uh, the National Criminal Information um, uh, Center, and so it's available to police officers in the car, much the same way um, civil orders for protection are. So when we talk about any DV related restraining orders, we want to make sure we pay attention to if those past criminal no contact or, or dankos, we call them. Obviously, civil orders for protection go into the NCIC. Har harassment restraining orders um, are another one. We see those as well, and that's something that's available to uh, victims in our, our county. And they can be either ex parte or, um, or as a result of a hearing. So we're looking just for the simple issuance of these uh, conditions or orders. It doesn't have to be, it's not limited to the current victim if you're working on a risk assessment based on a current case. And this is for the restrained, as the restrained party, not the victim. So um, those, that bumps up your point total a bit if you have a history of, of those, as you can see from the scoring sheet if you have it in front of you. So the next piece, number six, is whether or not there's a history of violations of no contact orders. Now these can be documented in reports or reported by the victim. Um, so for example, if we, if we are talking to a victim um, as part of our bail eval, which we attempt to do in our, in our uh, jurisdiction, and they say, yes, um, the last time he was arrested, um, he violated the no contact order. Or if you can, um, as part of a pre-sentence investigation, you're talking to a victim and you say, you know, he since his um, since being arrested, he's been under a no contact order. Has he abided by that? So you might get it reported from a victim. It can also be documented in reports. I always say to probation officers, if you see arrests, doesn't even have to be convictions, but if you see arrests for violation of OA, order for protection or whatever, you need to stop, drop, and roll because it's probably um, it's an important risk factor, and it also may be very indicative of, of a stalking um, business going on. So that's a piece of it. And again, that's three points uh, if this behavior is from the past and in the, in the current offense. Number seven is evidence of object used as a weapon. Now keep in mind this is a broad interpretation. It can be, doesn't have to be a gun or a knife, although those are the ones we think of when we think of weapon, and certainly they are are, are really high indicators of risk. But we're looking, it can be other things too. It can be using a bat, um, a telephone. One of our clients knocked his victim's teeth out when she tried to call 911. Um, strangling, tying with a cord. Any, any object that's used uh, ha is used as part of an assault, both in, in the current and in a prior, there's a, there's a point uh, piece for that. So, the use of a weapon as part of an assault is, a, is an important risk factor here. This was a good one. Um, I, I, this, this particular risk factor really changed, I think, how we look at cases, and that is whether children are present during the DV offense. Um, and they don't need to be a witness. They just need to be, be in residence. When we talk to offenders, if there are any probation officers in the room, if you ask your offender where were your kids when all this was happening, they will say, oh, they were asleep. 
but all the child advocates and all the research points to the fact that they, they aren't asleep, they're very aware of what's going on, and in fact, um, uh, this is this really sets them up to be to be uh, perpetrators potentially in the future. So there are all kinds of negative ramifications for for children being present. And I would also say that it isn't even just the impact on the kids. To me, as somebody who's supervised offenders and been involved with offenders for years, just the fact that they would would do this to the mother of their children or or knowing that children may see is it, it sort of gives evidence to a real attitude I think a real um, sense of entitlement and recklessness so note again here's another that I see there's a typo there are three points if children present in this and and the current and the prior so again this point total wraps up or ramps up a bit oh let's see here number whoops um, okay I'm going back and forth between two screens, so I apologize. So, current employment status. Now, this is a risk factor for um, for probationers in general, but it is really a risk factor, I think, with domestic violence folks, and and we need to keep it always in mind because I think it's about stability, financial stability, um, and regular separation. I'm always wary of those cases where you know the guy works from home. Or um, we had, we had a guy uh, who took would take his victim to work. He worked at nights at a hotel, and he would lock her and her their son in an empty room because he wanted him to be safe. He said so. They she never got a chance to reach out for services um, because of the constant you know surveillance and and uh, there was no separation during which she could access services. So we're looking at employment, and it's a yes or no thing. Um, in this in this particular question, it's not particularly nuanced, but we ask POs to probation officers to think about it in both as it relates to stability and the separation piece. Um, you've all probably are aware of the separation violence research that so many of these um, serious assaults happen in the context of separation or divorce, or as the newspapers would say, people are estranged. People are. A tr it's trouble, it's a troubled relationship, whatever it is. We're looking for a situation where a victim has separated from the defendant within the past six months. And this can be informal, can be brief, it can also be imposed. So for, for, for example, we have people coming out of prison who have been separated from their partners. And just the very fact of the separation, even if the people didn't choose it, it's imposed on them, um, is, is something that can um, uh, actually ramp up the risk. And so it can be either reported or sometimes we can infer it from, from you know, we can look at a history and figure out there were periods where this person was incarcerated or they left to go work somewhere else or there were there were no contact orders. So if, the, if there's been any of that in the past six months, um, that is a factor. Um, number 11 is whether this victim had a restraining order against this perpetrator at the time of the offense. And this could be any of those kinds that we talked about before. Civil orders for protection or criminal. And if any of those were in effect at the time of this current offense that we're evaluating for, there are some significant points to be added to that. Number 12 is whether or not this person was under any form of community supervision at the time of the offense. And by by this is a broad uh, a broad group of, of sort of societal um, supervision. But um, besides probation and parole, could be a release, a uh, pending court, court diversion, a family court go, case going through family court, child protection. We have a lot of offenders who are on the predatory offender registration. Um, here in Minnesota who end up also coming through DV court. So whether or not there's any kind of some form of supervision in place is another point factor. So when we get done then, um, we're looking for a score from 0 to 30 points. And again, this we named this, normed this against our population. Um, you could include this risk rating with bail evaluations for pretrial release decisions. Um, you can use it to determine a threshold for further assessment with the SARA or as a standalone risk thing. In our case, we also use it to override a low criminogenic score. So for example, if we have somebody who, who had the LS, the level of service case management inventory and they scored low on it, they would normally go to low risk, 
but they scored high on the DVSI, and we use that as an override for moving them to high-risk tra traditional supervision. And I think that that's an important, uh, important. I think that's an important distinction for corrections agencies to make. So we we followed that original 1,600 people or 1,500 people out for eight years. So we had 1,500 offenders who completed the DVSI in 2001. We followed them out, and over eight years, the general criminal recidivism was high, 56%. Now, you can make of that what you will, but it suggests to me that um, domestic violence behaviors um, have a high correlation to criminal behaviors, which is, which is also borne out in the APPA manual I referenced earlier. Um, and the re DV recidivism was 41% of those 1,400 people. Now, remember, these were all misdemeanor domestic violence offenders and 41% of them um, had new convictions. So that's, that's an important thing. I figured out from looking at all of this that if we use a DVSI score of seven or above, um, we're gonna most accurately identify the high and low risk offenders. So 64% of the high risk offenders were correctly identified and 62% of low risk offenders were correctly identified with a score of seven or above and the correlation is strongest with the higher scores. So when we think about the DVSI, I know I'm whipping through this, and um, but that, those were my instructions. Um, the strengths are that it's a validated tool. It's short, it's free, and uh, it uses, really relies on criminal justice data. It's designed to be able to use without interview. So I just wanna kinda of get clear on this. Um, one of our earlier speakers said that we ought to be spending our time and our resources on the higher risk offenders. And um, so I guess what I'm wondering is if you were, is this tool, would it be helpful? And it looks like it is from what you have. Would it be good for identifying the most dangerous people? And uh, is that the same as most likely to recidivate? In other words, are those two things kind of the same dangerousness? and recidivism, and if so, would this tool be a good one to use for placing people into offender programs? So we want to take the high-risk people and put them in a different program or give them something more or different than the lower-risk offenders. Would the PSI work for that? Sure. I don't think that dangerousness and risk to reoffend are the same. And I don't think we're able to, to um, I don't think we're ever able to determine exactly who is going to, I mean, these are just tools, keep in mind. Um, and as I said before, you can have somebody who's very dangerous from a criminogenic standpoint, but their DVSI risk or their domestic violence risk may be fairly low. You could have somebody who is um, very law-abiding most of the rest of their life and their choices, but with domestic violence, they're very high risk and very dangerous. So I think dangerousness is, is, a, um, is where we layer on some of those lethality related factors on top of a tool like this, which is, is um, basically, basically around recidivism. I know I sound like I'm talking around it, but I don't know of a tool that's going to give you all of that. I have a question. Nancy, can you use DVSI in a non-correction setting? We have a project right now in Hennepin County Family Court where cases that have been identified as having a domestic, possible domestic violence component are being screened with this. So I think you can. Um, we haven't seen a report on it yet, but they the family court workers have been trained and are doing a, a basic screen. See, the DVSI is really a screen around a group of risk of risk factors. There are other risk factors that are really that that aren't. And when I get to the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about the limitations of all of these tools. Um, they don't get at all the risk factors. This is just one screen to to look through, one lens, if you will. Thank you, Nancy. I have another question. Do you know of a, a tool called DVI, Domestic Violence Inventory? Yes. And do, what is your thought about that? I don't think much about it at all. 
Okay. It's uh, if it's CVI is what I'm. Is that the one where the it's all self-reported and the offender sits at a computer? Apparently so. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, right off the bat, if you have the offender telling you, um, uh, if if the offender is giving the data and it's all self-reported, without any other interpretation, that's to me a big limitation. When we were looking, um, and then the DVI is used in some, especially some of the rural counties out here in western Minnesota, but um, one of my agents went through and, and really thoroughly looked through the website, looked through the different forms, and basically they've got a group of risk criteria and risk interpretation things that they that they apply. Now, some of it maybe is helpful, but I, th I think anything that relies totally on self-reported data has got an inherent weakness. So let's move on to some of the limitations of the DVSI, and this is what we've just been talking about. There are limited risk factors. I haven't talked about some of the really important risk factors, um, like is, is the party, well, we're going to talk a little bit about them with the SARA, but this is limited to this group of risk factors, and certainly if you are aware of other significant risk factors, you have to figure out a way, even though it won't impact the score, to, to really impact your, your intervention strategy. There aren't many psychosocial risk items here. And again, when we talk about the SARA, I'll go through a few of those. Um, so those are some of the limitations and the fact that there's little to no victim input. It doesn't require victim input to do it. As I said, it's designed to be scored on criminal, uh, criminal justice databases um, and so it's it's going to have not as much of a of a uh, it's not going to be as important or or victim input isn't important and we all know that that is important and in a, in a really good response. So again, DVSI validated tool, short, free, and allows us to get a, a basic screen on recid likely likelihood of recidivism. The DVSIR is in production. Kirk Williams, who did the DVSI is working on this in Connecticut, and they've been at it for a while. I haven't read anything lately about it, but they say they found that it eliminated some of the unknowns. When they were trying to score the DVSI initially, they didn't have the data access or resources to, necessary to, to score it accurately, so they, they asked the author to, to, to tweak it for them, and that's what this, this is really about. It's 11 items. There's some overlap with the DVSI. Um, but it does also allow for a summary risk rating, which is what happens um, when we when we do the SARA. There's a place at the end of the SARA. So um, the initial studies have been good. Um, I think right around the maybe uh, right around where our studies with the DVSI were, um, 60 late high 60s, low 70s uh, accuracy. So um, I have some of those materials. You guys can email me if anyone wants to see them. Now, I feel like I'm erasing a little bit, but I know I've got only a few more minutes. So um, let me take you through the SARA. Um, developed also in Canada, those Canadians really have got quite the cottage industry going on the, on the assessment tools. But this is more of an assessment guide. It allows you to look at some different factors um, from a you know, multiple, you can use multiple uh, sources, multiple methods. You, they, it requires interviews with the offender and hopefully the victim, that's the goal. Um, there are some supportive uh, questionnaires and so forth that you can use with it, the Tolman and Marshall scales. I don't have time to talk about them, but they're something that we used when we started doing it. Um, you can use a variety of collateral uh, records, all of which allows you to, to weigh, um, to gather information and to try to develop a a risk rating. There's a number of places Sarah's been used. Um, uh, I would say uh, it lends itself really to, to any of these. We used it with the supervision assessment and case planning piece, and I think when you see it, um, you'll see why that would be important. If there are probation officers in the room, they can sort of identify why some of these things lend themselves to case planning. So. There are, there are four sections of the SARA. The first section is the criminal history section, and we're going to score on 20 items. One of them is whether or not there's been an assault of family members in the past. That would be brothers, sisters, parents, uncles and aunts, that kind of thing. Um, whether or not there have been assaults of strangers and, and or acquaintances. And lastly, 
whether or not there are past violation of conditional release or community supervision factors. Um, I know I'm not doing justice to this in the short amount of time I've been given, but each of these items has, a, again, a zero, a one, or a two-point uh, correlation, and then it gets scrambled um, at the end, and, and uh, there's a little bit of a math thing at the end, and you come out with a, uh, a score. So that's the first section. The second section is the, um, I got to put the MHS uh, uh, thing in there. Okay, the second section, which I think is, is interesting and important because it, different from the DVSI is it gets at some of the um, psychosocial adjustment issues and there are some of the things that we really um, become aware of in some of the most difficult cases. So relationship problems, separations, fighting, that kind of thing whether there are employment problems. And again, employment comes up everywhere. It's always a risk factor with, with offenders. Um, whether or not this person was a victim of and or witness to family violence as a child or, child or adolescent. So we, this is a, a new thing, and it's a psychosocial adjustment issue here. Substance abuse and dependence, we've talked about that, but that's also scored in this document. Here's a good one um, to keep in mind, suicidal or homicidal ideation. I think approximately Nationally, the statistics are that about a third of the, of the uh, homicides, domestic violence homicides, ha are a homicide suicide. In Minnesota, I spent 10 years on our fatality review team. We found that our actual averages were more between 50 and 60 percent of our domestic homicides were, were included a homicide suicide. So for us and for anybody working with these cases, if that's a present uh, factor, it's present, we really do need to, to address it and focus on it. Um, psychotic or manic symptoms, this has to do with mental health and, it, and, and it, to score the higher number, the two, you have to have, it has to be a diagnosis by a licensed professional. Um, a, a, a probation officer, another score could score the one with it, but it's a uh, you're looking for here where they're not professionals have diagnosed this. Now we always look at this last one, personality disorder um, with uh, anger, impulsivity, or behavioral instability. Most of us in probation say that's our whole caseload. So, but again, we'd be looking for a formal diagnosis of personality disorder uh, for the higher score in this one as well. So that's the second group of items. The third group is the spousal assault history. Now we're looking at, um, at, at the relationship um, this person has um, with intimate partners. So past physical assault is an item, past sexual assault or sexual jealousy. And this becomes um, uh, a, a, a piece that's, that's a little bit harder to assess sometimes but is really critical. That sexual jealousy, that total obsession focus um, control, those are pieces that, that we assess in this, in this, using this tool. Past use of weapons comes up again, but here we also th in, include threats of death, and I think the threats piece is important. You know, if you're a probation officer, I probably read thousands and thousands of police reports, and you get used to hearing or reading somebody saying, well, I'm going to kill that bitch. Uh, pardon my French, but you get the drift, and you, you think, well, he said it, but he didn't do it. But if you look at certain other research, David Adams' research, for example, um, in, his, in his book, Why Do They Kill? The killers had threats of death in something like 80% of the cases, whereas your run -of the run-of-the-mill run domestics that came through his, his batter intervention program, um, more, the, the, the statistics were more like 10 or 15%. So they matter, and here's a place where we can document them and count them. Um, recent escalation in frequency or severity, if that's what's happening, that's a risk factor. And there are ways probation officers can be trained to um, assess for that. Past violation of no contact orders, that suggests that person, as, as I mentioned in the DVSI, who's willing to ignore court orders and, and do it anyway. Um, extreme minimization or denial. So that's another factor for scoring. And lastly, attitudes that support or condone um, spousal violence. So now, this completes the th third segment, which is the spousal assault history segment. And the last segment in the SARA, which will take us to the 20 through the 20 items then, is the alleged and most recent offense. So now you're looking at the most recent offense, and you're looking for a couple things. One, 
was it a severe assault and or a sexual assault? Um, number two, were there weapons and or credible threats of death in this most recent offense? And did this occur in context of a violation of a no contact order? So with these now, we've got 20 items that, that get scored for the SARA. What the SARA also offers, though, is a chance to look at some other, um, really some, some other considerations. And sometimes this can be really important as well, whether there's a current emotional crisis, maybe the perpetrator lost a parent or lost a job, or there's something else going on, a mental health breakdown, um, whether or not there's a history of torture or disfiguring. Um, we have a number of political prisoners and refugees um, in our in Minnesota that have come from war-torn countries, and there may be a piece of that in that you want to highlight or at least pay attention to. If there's sadism, easy access to firearms and stalking, those are really important things. They're not scored here, but they're really important things to document. Recent loss of social support network, if something really drastic has happened with this person such that they've really lost these things. Any of these can be coded and included in the SARA, and, and, um, or they can't be coded, but they can be deemed critical. And again, I don't know if you have the SARA form in front of you, but the way you work with critical items is that you identify those things you're really going to work with, which are sufficient on their own to compel you to, it, to, to say that, that this individual poses a high risk. And, and the idea is that risk, um, it's, not, it's not just about the math. It's about what are the, what's the qualitative uh, kind of focus we want to put on these various risk factors. So scoring the SARA, again, each of these items, zero, absent, one, threshold, two, present. Those are Canadian terms, but the manual that they provide with the SARA is really helpful in figuring out the, the, uh, where they fit, whether they're sub-threshold or present. And then you determine the presence of any additional considerations, define which is critical, and then with that there's a scoring sheet on the back that you come up with a score. So, what would be good about the SARA? The strengths, again, validated tool, variety of information sources. It's broader, I think, and includes a lot of psychosocial risk factors. Um, and I think it also um, really lends itself to case planning. If I'm going to be working with this offender for the next couple of years, knowing uh, the, the, the vari this variety of risk factors, particularly the psychosocial, helps me I think develop an effective case plan. Limitations, it requires interviews if you don't have access to the victim or the offender. So for example, maybe in a Bailey Vale, if you're not sure you're going to have um, access, it's not going to be helpful. It's lengthy and it's costly. You have to buy the forms from, from MHS. So planning, when you do this, I see I'm almost at my end, so I'm going to just kind of wrap it up here. You have to figure out who's going to see your risk assessment, who's going to conduct it, who's going to see it, um, what data sources are available. If you, if Like Connecticut, if you don't have the right data in play at the right time, you're not going to be able to get an accurate score. What kinds of modifications to your practice and what kind of forms would you have to develop to make it a, a work? And how best you can involve your victim. Um, do you have access at the point you're willing to do it? If you can't, can you capture other ways to get the SARA relevant information? Um, and how will it be used? So this is just a quick chart of our, our uh, I'm not a researcher, but the green line is the reference line. And both the DVSI and the SARA um, were, had a positive correlation to risk. So I'm told by my researcher that this is a nice chart that this is a good analysis. <laughs> I know you can look at those things. I always say sometimes I feel like a dog watching television when I'm in these meetings. I see the pictures, I see the words, I hear them, but I don't always interpret them. So, um, so the conclusions of our eight-year study were that there was strong evidence of validity um, of, of, of both the DVSI and the SARA. SARA seemed to be a little more valid with females and first-time offenders compared to the DVSI. Um, and DVSI was most valid with the serious offenders. So with that, I feel like I'm racing to the end here. Basically, we're going to make sure we gather and weigh pertinent um, information for DV cases. We're going to develop appropriate overrides, um, which is what we were talking, what I was talking about earlier. With the, you can have the DVSI as an override for some of these existing corrections risk scales that don't 
do a good job uh, isolating the DV related risk factors. We're going to try to provide the court with accurate information for use in decision making. We're going to try to use the risk data that we get to, to case plan and, and uh, address the level of risk we see. But the thing we're not going to do is tell the victim that, um, well, I don't know, it's, we scored a two, that's pretty low, I think you're safe. We never want to be in that position. So with that, I have absolutely raced through my 45 minutes and I finished on time. So now I don't, it's up to the presenters. <laughs> Questions? I do, yeah, I'm here, I'm fine. Um, I have a question and I guess I want to start off by saying we've gotten a lot of information today, so this might be, I might have missed something that was very clear to everybody <laughs> else, honestly. But thank you for everything you presented. With the DVSI, other than the question, has the victim separated from the offender within the last six months, and did the victim have a restraining order against the offender? Uh, no, wait. Or is the, is the current employment status? Those other questions, it seems almost like the person would score the same at the beginning of intervention as they would after intervention, because it's all about prior history. So I'm wondering how yes. to use this really as any sort of gauge for safety throughout time if you're if, if someone's going to essentially score the same at the beginning of treatment as they would at the end. Well, here's the thing. And I are you a corrections person? No, I'm um, advocacy. Okay. Because the reason I ask is that what that's been a big stumbling block for corrections agencies. Because corrections folks have used like the level of service case management inventory, the LSCMI, and that has that has factors that are both when when I do this training, I focus I get people to focus on a dynamic risk factor and a static risk factor. So a static risk factor, you're absolutely right, is not going to change. Um, the fact that this per perpetrator w w uh, witnessed or, or witnessed um, uh, DV as a child, we can't unring that bell. Um, so the static risk, the static risk factors are not going to go down. And one of the things that hangs up corrections folks is they feel like, all right, so in these other tools, when he stops using and he develops appropriate friends and he, um, you know, gets his mental health stable, his risk score is going to go down. And and you're absolutely right. We don't have a tool. We don't. There is no DV tool that I know of that will have that. The best I can say is you look at the factors and say which of these are dynamic, which of these are static. And the static ones are not going to change. But if the dynamic factors go down, for example, um, there's not a. Um, they're not under any community supervision. They're not. Um, it's been six months since the since the. I, I know there's a six months um, time correlation in the DVSI with separation. When you get when you look at if the dynamic risk factors have receded somewhat, that's the best you can do. So you're right. That is there. There is not a way that you're going to say, oh, now things are good. I, I like the question that this critical, which I didn't uh, understand before, sort of the critical factor, uh, or, or what is it, cannot be coded but can deemed critical. Because what we found <coughs> is sometimes the person will score low, but the victim is really, really scared. And so we feel like she's the best um, source of information for how dangerous he is because with good reason. Um, would that be? Of course. It, would that be something the critical risk if the victim is really, really scared? Would that, how would that play into this? Well, we've not, yeah, do, you, do, you, do you guys have a Sarah form in front of you? Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. You know, there are, there's a group of factors that you can identify and, and maybe uh, deem critical. But I think where the victim's fear piece comes in is so, for example, remember I was saying at the beginning of the Sarah doesn't come in in the DVSI, but in the Sarah where, we, where I said it's important to interview the offender and the victim. So we're looking at threats of death, threats of, of whatever. Those, those kinds of places the victim input could be really critical. And that would be a place to do it. But the thing I want to say about risk tools is that I, I, I can't walk into court and say, well, Your Honor, I interviewed John Jones. Um, 
and he's a he's an 18 on the Sarah. Thank you, and sit down. I can't do that. The, a number doesn't tell the story. What you have to remember with risk tools is that they're just they're just tools. They're just some things to assist you. So I can say to the judge. You know, he's an 18 on the, he scored 18 on our risk form. I'm going to highlight for you a couple of the areas where his risk seems high, but I also want to make sure we take time to talk about, um, about putting this in some context. So that's where I can say, you know, he's, he's an 18, but where he's high is in, is in the psychosocial items around, um, uh, around threats and sexual assault and so forth. And your Honor, it's not scored as part of this, but I believe he's stalking her. These are the things that support my decision. So never, never, never do you just walk in and give a score. You always have to put it in context for the court. You always have to look at where the risk, kind of the risk pockets are and make sure you case plan for those, make sure the court's aware and that you think about the unintended consequences of of, of this. It's, it's not about, it's honestly, you could have a, somebody who's a low score and is an absolute domestic terrorist, and you could have somebody who is a, a criminal, a nightmare criminal, and they may not be high risk in this. Pers it's it's not that exact a science. So I guess what I want to say is it's about taking the information you get, putting some kind of context around it that makes it paints an appropriate picture for the court and gives you really. Um, a direction to go with your case planning. So the victim's fear is huge and it's absolutely critical and depending upon whether or not the victim gives us, how the victim may give us permission to to share that or if they do, we have to figure out a way to do that to make it to make it uh, contextual. So never can any of these these items, um, none of these things are going to score all the important risk factors. Thank you. So now, now I've disillusioned you. Mm -hmm. um, does it only apply to spousal situations? Yeah, um, yeah. Um, intimate partner and typically intimate partner, although I think um, both of them are designed for intimate partner, not spousal, but intimate partner. They are both um, sensitive to same-sex relationships that are intimate partner. They tend to be not as accurate with other kinds of familial violence, like it's they're worthless in terms of of, of sibling inter-sibling violence. Um, sometimes they, they you can still what I've told people is if you like our investigators who do this, they I'll get this call. I've got a father son thing, and the son beat up the son hit the father. Should I be doing a Sarah? And I'll say no. But what you should do is identify if any of those risk factors might still be a, I mean, you know, they know the tools well enough. If you see that some of those things are, are there, you may want to go ahead and, and at least highlight them as risk factors. Um, I don't think there's a good tool for scoring, you know, parent-child or child-child um, uh, risk. So they, these are basically and should be thought of as an intimate partner assessment tools. Any other tools that we haven't, that you haven't talked about that are promising for domestic violence? Well, did Connie, what did Connie talk about? She's mentioned she these. Think so. I'm thinking, I just want to make sure we're not missing anything that's really uh, great. I know some jurisdictions use the ODERA. It was designed, I know the state of Maine, I'm guessing they talked about it because I know they work Bad Women's Justice Project has worked pretty extensively with Maine. Um, that is, that is a, um, the ODERA is one, although designed for law enforcement and first responders, I know some corrections departments have worked with it. I, uh, for my own view, my very favorite tool is the SARA because it covers such a broad range of data and it allows you to bring in some, you know, data from a bunch of different sources, not just criminal justice data. So that's my favorite, but my own jurisdiction has felt that it's too time consuming. We can't do it. So these are the ones I know of. I'm not aware of, of any others that are in common use as I've gone around the country that are in common use in departments of corrections. Now there may be, obviously the danger assessment is huge for for working with we're working with victims, and this is where I think, um, for example, if you have um, and and you guys have you you've had somebody present on the Maryland lethality protocol for first responders. Well, 
Well, at any rate, um, lots of times, lots of times, different groups of us are doing different kinds of risk assessment for our own purpose, but we don't share that data. So one drum that I try to beat is, all right, so if somebody else, one of our criminal justice partners is doing some kind of a risk thing in a, in a format that informs their practice, the data that they collect could also be helpful to us. And so we need to do a better job of sharing. So for example, if the police at the scene do the, do the um, Maryland lethality protocol, and of course much of that is based on Jackie Campbell's danger assessment, and they determine that the person is high risk and they're going to place the call to the advocate on the scene, that's sort of, they're sort of done at that point. But the data that they developed could be very important for me in my risk assessment. So um, I'm not aware of other risk tools per se uh, other than the ones you've probably been talking about. Again, I think it comes down to better sharing of information and then using it at a point in your practice where it informs your practice but doesn't minimize the complexity of the case or, or give people a, um, I mean, if you're going to use it just to sort, then you're, then you're losing the opportunity to take the risk factors and then use them for case planning. Do you know what I mean? I think we have to take whatever risk tool we use and expand its use. Thank you. Anybody else, sir? Thank you for rushing through this. Um, you have so much to say. We gave you no time whatsoever, um, but it was uh, it was very helpful. Thank you. Well, if you have any questions, send me an email. I I'm uh, happy to have done it. You guys have a I you guys have a great uh, rest of your day. <laughs>